So I'm just going to start my um, introduction to this sharing session. This is actually the most valuable tool that we have in our training because we just get to talk to everybody and see what's working. So I'm going to have everybody mute themselves. And then when you want to ask a question or share an experience, unmute yourself. And then um, there's not so many of us that will um, be going over the top of each other. So um, we've got some questions that we ask. And the thing that people want the most out of our trainings that we have found from our evaluations is they want to know what's working in other places. They want to know what they could do to make their council more effective. And they also want to share what's working with their council. So um, the first question for our sharing session and everybody um, remember if there's principals and educators and parents, I want to hear from everybody to tell me what's working from their perspective. So don't feel like, oh, I'm you know, a parent and someone's already spoken or whatever, just go ahead and tell us what you're thinking. So our first question is, much of the work of councils is to act as, sorry, I have to move this box. Mm. Let me just close my participants and close my chat. And Jerry, do you know how I get rid of this? Maybe like that. I can't read the question. Karen, will you read the question? I'm sorry, it's got WebEx stuff in front of it. Um, well, let's see. Natalie, would you like me to do it? Yes, yeah. Paula, can you see it? I'm so sorry. My yeah. WebEx information is in front of my PowerPoint. So tell me if this is the question. I think this is it. What activities or projects has your council undertaken to improve the student academic experience at your schools? Yes, that's what we want to know. So one of the roles of the council is to improve the academic experience. What are you doing? What are you seeing done that works? Okay, has anyone decided to unmute themselves? Natalie, we have just invested money into TA for each grade level and each teacher to try to make up that gap. That is such an important thing. So what areas, what academic areas are you focusing on when you make that investment and how are you doing it? What is um, being added to the experience? Uh, we have TAs for math, for language art, and then we um, have invested in a STEM program, the uh, Infinity program, so that we can get some STEM. Um, and then we just hired uh, a TA that's singly devoted to a grade level. We have between four and five teachers on a grade level, and it's an all day, they're with them all day, tutoring them half the day in math, the other half in reading. So have you have you seen an increase in scores with that additional help? Uh, immensely. We had um I think it was 78 level. We're uh, K6. And we had 78% of our kids in third grade that were on red or yellow on the Acadians testing went up to either blue or green. That's amazing. 
Okay, so I'm sorry, I was gone for a minute because of my internet. Um, Donna Hunter said that we have academic trackers who also help co-teach our basic math classes. So that's like um, a great way to make sure, first of all, that the trackers know the students, but second, to make sure that the students are getting extra help in basic math and that the students are meeting regularly with the tracker. I love that idea. What else are people doing? We hired a new counselor to help the students who are depressed and confused because of COVID, not seeing their friends, having to wear masks, and they, some of them were just acting out. So we have someone at school now that's talking and helping them with that. Um. That's a great idea, Melanie. And let me just add something that we didn't discuss in our last meeting. Um, behavioral interventions are allowed with these funds, but they need to be part of an academic goal. So if you can see at a high school level that You cut out again. I think she has some issues with her internet. Maybe she should be part of that T-Mobile 1 million. <laughs> Paula, is that something you can answer? So I'm not sure what the question was. I'm sorry, I was paying attention, trying to think of how I can help her with this. So ask the question again. It wasn't really a question, it was more like of a statement. Okay. Just stating that something that our school has done to help improve um, some of the kids are feeling outcast and depressed and not wanting to come to school, do the masks, and some of them are just acting out. So we got a counselor that is not just counseling the kids, but also doing a friendship group to help them mentally with the COVID-19 that's going on. And um, Natalie, before she cut out, she was talking about the um, the behavior interventions, but they need to be related to the academic. Um, they just have to be related to the academic improvement. Well, since the kids are um, understanding more of the COVID-19, their test scores have gone up. Yeah. So Natalie, do you want me to respond or do you want to? <laughs> um, I think that you're a little bit more reliable than I am. So why don't you <laughs> respond? And then um, when you're ready for me to change the slide, if I can't hear you, you could just chat message me. So I put it on the second slide. I don't know if we're there yet, but now back to Paula. Yeah. So I, th I, you know, we're learning that behavioral issues certainly are more prevalent well maybe they're not more prevalent but maybe we're paying more attention to them now maybe that's the appropriate um way to state it and it used to be that uh, school and trust plans were limited in how much money could be spent for behaviors. and that is no longer the case as long as the behavioral component supports an academic goal so you wouldn't want to set a goal that was just that was specifically about um, mental health support for your kids related to COVID, but recognizing that that mental health is necessary for kids to learn. It certainly could be a component of a literacy goal, a science goal, a math goal, what it, whatever it is that is your primary concern at the school. If the students need that kind of behavioral support. It certainly is appropriate. It just it needs to support 
academics first, because the School and Trust program is an academic program under the law. Hopefully that helps. Other ideas? Uh, one thing that our school is doing, we're a junior high, and we had our ISS counselor, I believe they hired maybe one or two other people to help her, and they identify a handful of students that are failing each term, and then they follow those students uh, through their school day, and they meet, I think it's weekly, with a counselor and with all of the teachers involved in that student's education. And they collaborate, I think it's only like a 10 or 15 minute meeting each week. And they kind of, the teachers bounce ideas off of each other, how to help the student or, hey, they're failing in this area or, hey, they're doing really great in this class today. And our school has seen huge improvements in those failing kids with that that team that goes around with them and and as they get you know one student up to par then kind of drop them off and then pick up another one as the year goes on may i ask for that um paul your kid group intervention thing um you said that once they're succeeding you know you choose a new student is there a follow-up for those students that you've helped so that they don't go back on the on a difficult track uh that's a good question i'm not a teacher i'm just on the community council um i can ask them i know that i'm almost certain that they're they're tracking them that they're tracking their grades and I think it's a matter of how many students they could help at a time so that, you know, kind of the the 10 or 8 that need the most help uh, get that attention and then it kind of rotates. But I'm pretty sure some of our trust land funds money went towards getting some other people to help that in school suspension counselor to be able to do that. Okay, let's see if we can go on to the next question. That doesn't mean if you have other ideas that you want to throw out on the first question. This is just a sharing time. Um, Before we start that, what, what sure. school was that school? A South Davis Junior High School. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I have one that you're looking for. Example. Sure. Thanks. Um, at our junior high, we find that we have um, between 30 and 50 students who come into seventh grade who are far below reading level. So last year we implemented, um, we hired a reading specialist and they immediately at the beginning of the year, they test all the kids coming into the junior high and they take the lowest reading scores and they assign those kids to this reading specialist class. And I mean, these are kids who are not just a grade level behind, but like three or four grade levels behind in reading. And so they actually hired, well, with our community council money, we hired a former elementary school teacher because she has the skills to teach reading, whereas junior high school English teachers don't actually have the skills to teach actual fundamentals of reading so this is a rotating class and as track each kid and they have all these activities that not activity um like uh tracking systems and materials that community council has also helped to fund and so these kids are in this class and they're tracked on a i think they reassess them about every two weeks so that once they've hit the right grade level, then they're rotated out of the class and back into um, just the regular English classes. And this has helped because what they were finding is kids who were that far behind in reading were failing in all the subjects. And yet, even though the teachers knew this, they didn't have the skills to go back and teach a kid how to do basic things. So, um, 
hiring that specialist has it's an ongoing project but we've already seen successes of kids rotating out of it and you know some kids just need to fill in a few blanks and then they can read a lot better um and then connected to that uh they also our community council also helped um create a um a reading library for the special ed group um so the kids have ongoing reading needs and these books were not just um they were lower level reading but on topics that are appropriate for junior high school kids does that make sense so um they weren't little kid books they were appropriate for junior high school kids so they didn't feel stupid but they um were the easier reading level like on a third grade level of reading and that 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 special ed teacher talks about how this has changed it for her students because they don't feel like they're being treated like little kids anymore she went out she did the work she found what she needed um and we went through that it took a few months for it to process through um school community council because it was a specific need but because we had right really high reading literacy needs those two things the specialist and the um the targeted library those have um really been helpful in changing meeting the needs of our literacy goals I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Sorry. These are excellent ideas. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we had a question. I'm not sure this has been answered because I came a little bit late. Um, but Sharon is asking, what are elementary schools doing to get the arts back into schools? Can we help fund this as part of the academic goals? I know music definitely has been proven to help academics, for instance. What about other arts? Um, so I'm going to answer part of the question, then throw it out there for you to uh, talk about what maybe schools have been doing. Um, art is part of the curriculum, and anything that is in um, the core standards uh, can be identified as people's greatest academic needs. I expect in Natalie's training, she pointed pointed out that there are there is a list um, that schools must address first. But if the school is addressing that list of needs, they can certainly address anything else in the uh, core standards that they that they want to. And certainly, art, including music, is um, part of that uh, part of that standard. So. Um, Sissy is saying she highly recommends hiring an elementary teacher. Um, if you're look, oh, she's talking about literacy. Yeah. Yeah. So she was talking about the pri prior conversation. You can see that in the chat box. Do any of you have suggestions about getting arts back into elementary schools? <laughs> When when my my youngest is in kindergarten now, when he's in first grade, I volunteered my wife to start a children's choir at our elementary school. Good for you. <laughs> and it was nice of her to accept that assignment. <laughs> the principal was all over the map. Yeah. I know that there are schools that do integrate art into um elementary schools that integrate art into other subjects um uh that the beverly taylor Sorensen program um I, i've participated in that a in a couple of places where they identify um they identify what they want to support with the arts and it might be science or it might be um it might be history and then the kids um, in an art form uh, internalize that and and act it out um, through music. It's it's really pretty awesome. Uh, Whitney's saying that their council pays for half the salary of an art teacher, and the Sorensen Foundation pays for the other half. The important thing to remember about the Beverly Taylor Sorensen program is it is 
a program that's intended to um, it uh, funding reduces over the course of time. The thought process is it will help you get it established. And then it's intended that the school will gradually take over that responsibility. So that's important to remember. Um, okay. At our school, we have an art and a music prep that the teachers take their classes to. And then our art teacher does an afternoon of the arts and our music teacher will write a song to sing during either a Christmas program or a school program. Okay, maybe we should move on to the next question, um, which is aside from the important work of preparing and implementing school plans, what is the best project or activity that you know of that a school community council has implemented? So this would be outside the school land trust plan. Have your councils implemented any projects or activities that have been helpful to your students? Yes, without using the funds. Yeah, so if it's not academic, you're not going to be using school and trust funding, um, but a council certainly can take on other projects. I Maybe I can share a couple um, from when I was on a high school council, and this has been a long time ago. Uh, but I will tell you that we had a very engaged high school community council the last couple of years that I served. And there, um, uh, we instituted a, um, an arts, um, an art gallery. So what the, that could display student artwork in the school. So it was actually um, a teacher conference room where they started holding meetings when um, like when district people would come to the school or when officials would come to the school or whatever, but it was a room and they uh, they arranged it so the tables could be rearranged in different um, configurations and um, student artwork was placed in there as a, as a showcase. We also did a um, Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, there was a decision, the council would choose a teacher, a former teacher, well, it could be a current or a former teacher, a former student, um, and they would be inducted during the week of homecoming into the Hall of Fame. And there was an assembly where those people talked about their time at the high school and what they wish they had known when they were in high school and how high school helped them prepare them for what they were doing. Um, and that was a that was a cool thing that we did. We also had a couple of really uh, concerning safety issues. Um, and we were concerned about a part of the parking lot that was not lit. And of course, after games, that was the place where um, fights and things like that would happen because it, they weren't, it wasn't lit. So took on a project to light um, that part of the parking lot. And it took us about three years and we partnered with the education foundation in the district so that they helped match the money. But there was a fundraising project that went on for the course of three years and we appointed a task force and a parent who helped us um, get that done. But anyway, all three of those were projects that the council just took on, um, but didn't have anything to do with the school land trust program really. Do any of you have other ideas? Um, oh, our elementary school community council organizes Spanish interpreters for parent teacher conferences. No cost, but it's our responsibility to get volunteers and pull it off. That is awesome. Our school, our community council, we um, implemented a pride squad. So all of our sixth 
graders are part of the pride squad and they rotate what they get to do. And so there's a group of them and one makes morning announcements, one makes afternoon announcements. One makes sure everyone has a friend on the playground or they make sure the equipment's out on the playground or they set up for assemblies or they help in the lunchroom. They just all have something that they do. And it's really helped with like communications and social skills for our older students. Great, great idea. Are there any others? I think this is an area where council sometimes don't realize there are other, there are other things that they can be involved in if they choose to. Um, it's not required, but if you choose to take on um, other kinds of projects or you see a need, um, it can take that and um, and run with it. Okay, another one. Go ahead. Sissy, did you want to volunteer an idea? Okay. Um, it was a very short one, so I just was typing it up. But we just made a um, frequently asked questions page for um, our tab for our school website. Um, that was done by our school community council. One of our subcommittees took it on, figured out what questions people call the secretaries about all the time. And then we found the answers, made hyperlinks, and had our webmaster at the school um, put it all together and kind of helped design the content. And, and then it's an ongoing project as we feel like there are more questions that people ask all the time. Even the really basic things, the things that you call the secretary about, like, where is the school calendar? Or how do I know if it's going to be today? Or where's the parent contact? Or I'm totally new. Who do I talk to about PC today? Just basic questions. And that's what we did. That's great. Lisa, can you talk a little bit more about your outdoor classroom? We have a part of our outdoor area that is has a lot of trees and it's on the north end. So it just turns into a mud pit in the spring when it rains. <laughs> and so we are, we raised some of the money and the district has matched some of it. So with that, we are uh, creating an amphitheater type area seating with rocks and stuff that the kids can sit on, um, a little bridge, some different areas, some seating areas that kids can use to sit on while during recess to read or to play games, chess and things like that. But then the little amphitheater area where the classes can go out and do science or math or whatever they want to do outside. Great idea. And especially during this kind of COVID time, the more time we spend outside uh, is better than being in groups inside. So that's that's a really great idea. Are there others or wish you move on to the next question? Do you have other ideas? Okay, do you want to do the next slide, Natalie? Okay, let's see. Um, describe a collaborative effort that involved the council and other groups at the school or in the community that improved the student experience. And then talk about the role that the council took in that effort. Anybody? Um, I, our school is just doing the, with the safety and the digital citizenship, our PTO takes a big part of that and does the white ribbon week and um, makes sure that they work with the computer teacher that we have. Um, and so they all kind of work together to make sure that that digital citizenship and safety, um, school safety is all kind of covered with that white ribbon week. Great. And what what part does the council, what's the role of the council in that project? Mostly just to kind of talk about when timeline wise that fits into the school year and um, just kind of have an open discussion. But the PTO really does most of the actual legwork of making sure it happens. But just because it's part of the plan that we're supposed to oversee, we just make sure that that gets put into the school year. 
It's more of a coordination uh, role. Excellent. Good idea. Other ideas? Yeah, I have one. Um, we have a school a walk to school safety plan and um, noticed that one of our sidewalks was the kids had to cross the street twice in order to fulfill the safety plan because there was no sidewalk. And so the council worked with one of the parents to write a grant to UDOT um, along with our principal to get money to have that sidewalk put in. Um, and it was, we worked through the city council as well and the property owner of the property. And so it was a big team effort. We got that sidewalk put in so the kids can just have a straight shot to school. That's awesome. Anyone else? Not going to try to top that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you when that happened. My next to the last year on a council, and this is going to date you about it anyway, because I think the thought process um, is, is useful. Um, at the high school, we had um, two girls that had been chatting online with um, some boys and the boys were posing as uh, Weber State, I, if I recall right, engineering students. And of course, these young girls were really taken by that and this communication kept going on and on. And um, eventually the, these guys lured the girls to meet them um, and they were abducted and uh, eventually were returned back um, to the school, but it was like three days later. And it was such a concern for the community that the, um, the school community council took it on as a project, said we need to be communicating with parents and with students about the um, concern of online predators and how, um, and what you can do to safeguard yourself. But we knew that the school community council was not gonna be the most effective group in, in all of that. So they ended up being more of a coordinating effort um, and had the students, um, uh, the student council who did a survey of students of the school to find out what kinds of communication was going on and what kinds of safety protocols they were engaging in and at that time it was basically none at all uh, students are wiser now i think than they were then um, there was the pta then take took on a role of providing information for parents um, and the school community council then arranged for an evening for parents and students together where we had um, police officers who came and um, it was law enforcement officers, but I believe there was also a, um, a internet safety person. And they just did a one hour assembly warning people about what to do and what not to do. So it was, it was, it was important. I think it was an important thing that the school did and it was effective because it was one of those really awful things that happens and you wish you had done something about it first. But it was the council that did the coordination and then um, each one of the entities took, um, took a piece. Hopefully we prevented other missteps from happening. Let's see, we've got in the chat box, um, we have an area of our grounds elementary. Oh, that's where you explain. Thank you for doing that. Is there anybody else who has a, a thought they would like to share? I have a question. I dream about I'm doing a um, having our community council work with the community to build a um, garden at our school. So if anybody's done that at their school, I would love information whether they want to send it to you and you can send it out to us or whatever or you want to talk about it more, i would love to have a place done by the council so are you talking about like a vegetable garden 
you talking about a nature garden? What are you thinking? Well, any of it. Um, I think about a school I visited back east a couple of years ago, and as part of their playground, they actually had an area where they could planted vegetables, but also flowers and also herbs. And um, I mean, it's different back east. You don't need sprinklers in a lot of places. But it just inspired me. Eight, there was this nature area that was integrated into the playground. It was just a corner, but the kids could explore it and look at it. And, and then I, um, as part of their actual classes, they went out and um, worked on it, planted it, took care of it. it. It extends into the summertime, so it's not just during the school year. But anyway, I would love to see, hear anybody's ideas about how to make that work here in Utah. I know that there are some charter schools who have done similar things, and I remember. Um, I, I remember a, um, a Springdale, Utah has a little school. And I went there about, gosh, it's probably been 14 years ago or so, but they actually planted the garden with school trust lands money. And it was part of a science program and part of a finance program where they actually planted the vegetables and fruits and vegetables that were grapevines too, as I recall. And then um, when the garden started to producing, they actually sold them. And so it became, it was an elementary school, but it became part of a project where they, um, uh, whether where it integrated another a number of parts, it was Springdale Elementary. Um, if you'll send me an email, I don't know if I can still find those because I don't think our database is quite there. But I could put you in touch with um, the school. Karen, you may know of charter schools that do that. Can you help with this part? I know that there is a charter school out in Tooele that is doing that, and uh, it, but it was, uh, I just want to make very clear that it was, they did use trust funds, but they did it with, a, like Paula indicated, that it was in conjunction with an academic goal uh, in the science area is the one that I think theirs was. Um, I, I can't remember uh, the name of the charter school. Um, but I know it's in Tooele, uh, the Tooele district at least, but um, I can I can find out that information. And, um, if you if you would send me or if I could get your email address, I, I would have to send you um, the name of the school. I apologize. I, I don't know that just off Okay, good ideas. Anything else? Any other ideas people want to share? Or questions you might have? I have um, our, our elementary school uh, we rent a garden plot at a community garden that's maybe a block away. Um, it's not part of the school community council. Um, so you'd have to talk to it's a we have a green team is what they call them and they take care of the garden all year and during the summer and they orchestrate everything there. Um, so you might want to talk to the green team leader at Woodstock and find out uh, more about what they do. Um, Cause it's been great. I've been a member of that and my kids love going to the garden and helping um, plant things and harvest and um, weeding during the summer. Uh, each family takes uh, they just have families sign up for a week to take care of the garden over the summer and uh, we have like a fall festival where um, the kids come and they can decorate a pumpkin and just fun stuff like that. Um, but we also do trips where each grade will go over to the garden and um, plant in the spring, plant something, and then in the fall, um, they go back and they harvest. So each kid has to harvest and plant in the school year. You know, that's a great idea. I know that there are some districts that have policies that might prevent that from happening because they've had mm -hmm. gardens in the 
past that got overgrown and people didn't care for them or whatever, right? I mean, so if uh, if a school could do it as a club or a class or something on property that's not on the school property, they could still have the same experience if you run into a uh, an issue where um, it's maybe not allowed. That's a really that's a really great suggestion. There's some really great ideas in the um, in the chat box. We did have a question. Anybody have ideas for supporting ELL students in high schools? If any of you had experience with that? <laughs> uh, ELL is English language learners. So it would be students that um, probably where uh, English is not probably spoken in their home or they've just barely come from uh, another country. So it's English, English language learners. I know that we have um, school and trust plans that specifically address um, the needs of um, English language learners. But I'm not remembering off the top of my head specifically what they did. Um, okay, so Paul is asking, what is the most successful activity you have had to get parents involved that worked? I know that that can be a challenge, right? I think it's the ultimate challenge. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, a couple of principals called me this year, one from Park City, and he said they have never had a need to hold a council election because they, you know, they were in the begging mode. And this year, for some reason, 14 parents applied and they were having to figure out how, how to hold an election and anyone away, right? Um, but, um, I think sometimes it's just because people don't, don't really know. Um, I, I can tell you one experience that I had that I thought was really, well, it just, it made me laugh. I was one day, I was one day at the gym and I know that we're not going to gyms now, right at the moment, but I had been going to a gym for a while. And, um, one morning I was probably riding the bike and reading, reading at the same time. And I heard two um, women who were chatting to each other and they were next to me on, on stair steppers and they were going like crazy and talking and chattering and chattering. And then finally one of them said, so school's going to be starting right away. And um, we have a really great PTA and a really great Council, which one do you want to be on? <laughs> and, uh, she was so enthusiastic. Um, I just, I thought, you know, it's just, just a matter of people talking to someone uh, directly to them. And before they were through talking, she said, well, what do each one of them do? And so they, ex she, ex the, the one who had been on explained and she said, well, I think I'm going to try the school community council because I would really like to be involved in a science program or something. So sometimes it's just a one to one thing. I think sometimes also people don't understand how much money a council has. Um, but Paul, maybe you've tried all those things and they didn't work. Okay, so I've said this before in other trainings in past years, but honestly, one of the things that worked best for us to get parents onto SEC, and I'm on both elementary and junior high for the last uh, four years at junior high and eight years at elementary, and the best thing is to find people 
we're kind of done with PTA because PTA is so uh, program oriented and kind of creativity oriented. And sometimes people learn out of that constant fundraising, you know, creative come up with read a thought and all that stuff. They're, they're tired of that. And if you can find somebody who is still loves the school, but is just wants something new, I go and say to them, hey, you seem like a person who really wants to be involved with the actual nitty gritty, looking at curriculum, looking at testing, working with the teachers one on one. And I see students for you. It's not the same as PTA. So sometimes it just helps to differentiate between those two because they can be bumped together in people's minds. But PTA is a very different beast from SCC. And I don't know, for me personally, I found my people at SCC. I'm much more logical and want to figure out the problems that I solve them. And PTA is so awesome and fun, but it gets tiring sometimes. So that's my two cents on that. I, th I think the question I was asking was more, um, what activities have you seen to get the parents involved in their kids learning and in the classroom and stuff like that? What, Because as a community council, we talked about, well, I went to a meeting in the spring with the district um, and, and they, they talked about, you know, what have you done? And I, I think the more we've reached out to the parents, the more they've reclused because a lot of them just want to send their kids to school to be taught. And I think these teachers are being held to a standard that is unattainable as far as getting parents involved and and teacher success or uh, student success and stuff with without any support from the home. So it was more have you done anything? Have you seen anything? Any activities or stuff to get the parents involved in the classroom and in the kids learning? Uh, Paul, I would like to um, mention something that um, when I was doing a training at Northwest Middle School in Salt Lake District. I went to the community council meeting and there said about, uh, I think there were two parents there that did not speak English. And there was an interpreter sitting to the side of them that she had gone out and befriended uh, those other parents and told them, if you will come and be part of the school community council and see the difference you can make in the school, We'll interpret for you so that you can feel part of it. I know that may not be an answer to get parents, but one of the things that we hear most often is the diversity of school community councils are not reaching out to maybe some some of those who are from different countries. So I thought I would just throw that out as a, an example of a success of how a school actually went out got the interpreter, befriended them, and then while the meeting was going on, the parents, they had made arrangements for the parents um, at the end of the meeting, go into the library and to learn English. I thought it was amazing. So any other any other thoughts? I know um, uh, sometimes what has to happen first is to identify why the parents at your school are not being involved. And sometimes sometimes you know that could make the difference about how you decide to approach it. Um, one time when I was doing um, a training, we were talking about parental involvement specifically. Um, the concern came up that sometimes there are parents of students in a school where they've come from cultures that parents really weren't welcome in schools. And um, so this uh, community council chair had decided that she was going to try and engage parents in the school just to even set foot in the school. And I understand we're not doing a lot of setting foot in the school right now, but I, I think it, um, um, I think it's an important lesson for going forward. And she said, I didn't know how I was going to overcome that, um, that challenge. But she decided that every parent cares about children and they will, 
come out if it has to do with the safety of their kids. And so she um, she organized some of these parents into um, a project where they were helping kids cross the street to school. And because they had to cross the street just be many of them just before they got to the school. And she she felt like if the parents took turns helping with the crossing, then eventually maybe they would choose to set foot inside the school. And she she used that as the process to try and um, help parents feel comfortable about even coming into the school, being introduced to the principal and so forth. So she used that safety issue as a way to kind of um, heighten their awareness and make the, and have them choose um, to participate. Sometimes, of course, parents are not involved because they're working two jobs. And then, you know, then that's kind of another issue. But it doesn't mean that parents can't be engaged. They just maybe can't come to school to be engaged. They can still be part of helping their children um, at home. And I think you make a really good point, Paul. Um, students, we know, do better when parents are involved in their education. Um, I would add um, that in my experience with multiple schools, you know, look at your secretary and how does walking in the school feel? Because I've walked into certain schools and feel like just the look of like, they're very short with you. What do you need? And obviously, they're, you know, like, and if you go at a certain time of day every day, some secretaries are just really curt and I'm in the middle of doing stuff. What do you need? And others are very welcoming. And even that will just change how people feel about your school and how they feel about coming back to help like they they came to help one time they felt like they were in the way and then they don't come again our secretaries are amazing so <laughs> and i've been di different times of the day they just so yeah so that i mean for some schools it could be an issue and and like as our schools become more locked down with like you have to walk in and show your ID and and you can't just walk in and you, it, it starts to feel like you're trying to enter a prison. Um, that can start. You might feel like they know you and it's it's good, but it's it's worth asking your parents. How do they feel when they approach the school? Do they feel like they are welcome to be there? That's a good suggestion. Thank you. I think COVID though, affected that. I mean, it's not like the secretaries are trying to make it a prison. It's just we have certain regulations that have to be followed. But I definitely think secretaries can make you feel welcome while taking your temperature and having you fill out a questionnaire. So I think you're right in that the head secretary is an important part, but I don't, I'm not sure how we can get around the feeling of having to check in and all of that stuff because of COVID. Well, I mean, you're talking about like, even if it's just like, hi, how's your day? Instead of grumping that they had to stop what they were doing. And, and if you have a secretary that isn't, that that's great um and and so and and it's hard because sometimes i feel like the more you show up the more they're like oh i know you but that first impression can make a big difference and and some that that small chat but it's not just the secretary like do you feel like you know where to park where to what door to come in do you know those things i mean back to that adding the frequently asked questions to the website comment you know do you feel like you're engaged and and you're part of the community part of that school community you like your child is there but do you feel like you're part of it so that you can come and join um like when my kinder my oldest went to kindergarten i'm like 
I've got no idea what I'm doing. Where do I go? How do I? And, and so having somebody like walk you through it would be a big diff make a big difference. I agree 100%. Your front office is your first impression. And if that first impression isn't positive, then who would want to come back? So I 100% agree with you on that is where you make or break a lot of relationships. And I, I agree. That's that's a good first impression. I think uh, maybe, you know, the, the idea of giving the parents when they come into kinder, um, have like a, a parent orientation day uh, where they know how to get around the school and stuff like that. That's a, that's a good, um, or even uh, other schools at different levels. When the kids first get to that school, uh, that's a good idea. Um, but even my, I guess my, my main question is getting, how do we get the parents to care even enough to want to do that? Cause I think if we offer something like that, you're still going to get, you know, five kids or five parents out of a, a whole grade level coming in for that orientation. And honestly, go ahead. Paul, I think you're ans you're asking like the one unanswerable question that everybody's asking is um, how do we get the parents involved? Parents have a lot on their plates right now um, with work and um, they're exhausted. Their um, children have a ton of homework. So not only are they spending all day in school, but they're coming home with all this homework and so the children are frustrated it becomes frustrating for the parents and um and it's especially with the quarantine this has exacerbated all of these issues for um, a, a majority of families and um it doesn't matter what your background is um this has affected like i said a majority of the families and so um how do you take things off of people's plates, you know, how, how to, how do you relieve their personal stress in order to give them that, that sense that they can feel engaged and that they can, um, because it is stressful right now for a lot of parents, especially when it comes to school and homework. Um, you just had the few months where everybody's at home trying to take care of their kids and realizing just how valuable teachers are, um, maybe a good way to go about that would be having a better connection with um, teachers and parents, um, because now that parents have an idea of what teachers go through, and also the teachers need a lot of support right now with all of the changes and virtual learning and things of that nature. Um, I think the biggest thing is, is how, uh, how do we create an atmosphere that allows people to be engaged? Thank you, Amber. Those are really great comments and there have been great comments in the side chat. I really like Jennifer indicated that she's here because a friend invited her and Sharon Karchner said, yes, we need to invite people we know or meet. So this is a um, we're at the end of our hour and we've had some really great sharing. Thank you for being here and being willing to share. Um, these are, are really great ideas. There's an evaluation there in the chat and that will help us um, to determine how to do things going forward. We're all in the same weird spot where these are not the kind of trainings we've done in the past. We've usually done in person, but thank you so much for participating. Please know that we are always available to support you and answer questions and pass on good ideas that you have um, that have happened at your schools. Thank you for choosing to serve on your school community councils and thank you for making time to be with us tonight. I think we're, we're gonna turn into pumpkins if we don't sign off. So have a good evening.